everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. Sorry for the delay in getting the videos out to all you guys. I had some issues with some technology as I said in the live stream on Tuesday. But the good news is, is I've got some upgraded equipment and a new camera, which hopefully is noticeable to you all. You now have the pleasure or the torture of having to watch me in 4K. Uh, but hey, we're back at it. And as I said in the live stream, I'm going to be trying to get out some Wheel of Time TV show news to you guys once every two weeks or so. And I'm going to get back to doing a lot more of the Wheel of Time lore videos because that's where my passion lies. Even though the news videos get a little bit more views, I just really want to get some more lore videos out there. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the top 10 villains from the Wheel of Time. Now, today's video is brought to you by Audible.com. Audible is the world's largest depository of audiobooks. I know many of you have reread the Wheel of Time series many times, uh, just like me. If you haven't listened to the books in audiobook form, you are missing out. It is a completely different experience and one I highly recommend. Uh, because you guys are viewers of my channel and Audible is the sponsor, they're going to be giving you guys two free audiobooks. Just head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash enablist to get your books. You are very much helping the channel by doing so, so thank you to all of you who have done that. Today's video will carry a spoiler rating of red, with spoilers running all the way through A Memory of Light. If you haven't finished the series yet, please watch at your own risk. So it's been a little while since I've done a top 10 style list, and so let me refresh you on how I do these. Before I make my list, I came up with five criteria that I believe are qualities of a good villain. I then ranked each villain in the series on the categories, and came up with total scores. The categories I chose are as follows. First, motivation. I don't believe a villain is incredibly strong unless us as the viewer or the reader can understand a little bit about why they do what they do. We don't have to agree with their reasoning, but having a rationale or reasoning behind their action gives villains a bit of nuance and it makes them feel more real. A character being evil just to be evil most of the time is kind of bland and uninteresting. Second criteria is power. A villain must be able to effectively thwart our protagonists. This would be a magical power, political power, fighting prowess, or even the power of persuasion. But if a villain lacks the ability to influence events, they're not an effective foil for our protagonists. Third is intelligence. This can kind of be considered similar to power, but I feel like it's another category all by itself. There are powerful characters that lack the ability to properly use that power. And so intelligence is the ability to be strategic, plan things out, manipulate events, and overall outsmart their opponents. Fourth is the culmination of the last three, and that's the villain's story arc, and whether or not they impacted the story. If they don't change the course of events to the main characters, then they really aren't a strong character. In addition, if the villain has an arc of their own, and they change throughout the story, that can also be really compelling. And our last category is how scary they are, or how much fear they can in induce. We all want villains that inspire us to be fearful for our main characters when they're around. If they never feel threatened, then they're not really doing their job right. All of these categories will get a ranking out of 10 for a total score for each of our characters out of 50. Now let's kick it off with the 10th best villain from the Wheel of Time series. Mogideon takes the 10th spot on my list. Now she's probably the least powerful of the Forsaken, yet she manages to survive the last battle, albeit in captivity. Uh, so let's take a look at her ranking. For motivation, it's never really explicitly stated why she joined the Shadow but it's clear that she wants to wield power from the shadows. She's an extremely fearful woman, which is something that we learn through her captivity with the Adam. She's a survivor and she has strong survival instincts and kind of a knack for getting out of those situations. But as for her motivations, I think that they are clear uh, in the story as to why she does what she does. Uh, and that she's really motivated by fear, but yet she wants to kind of manipulate events from behind the scenes. I, I really don't think it's that well fleshed out, though. And so for that reason, Mogideon gets a 6 out of 10 for motivation. Now, as for power levels, she's a Forsaken. And although she isn't the most powerful with the one power, she's basically a goddess to all of the other characters in the series. Uh, and she's a dreamer with control over the world of dreams as well. She's adept at espionage, and she's a very dangerous opponent for really anyone given how careful she is with her safety and she kind of strikes like a spider from the shadows. Well Gideon gets an 8 out of 10 for power. Now well, Gideon is very intelligent and so also for the most part she's aware of her own shortcomings although she doesn't really admit that publicly. She's great at weaving traps from the shadows and gathering information and even the other Forsaken are wary of her. Now she waits until the right times to strike and she's had the misfortune of coming up against Nynaeve a few times and she made one giant error that kind of cost her her freedom for some time. Uh, but even though she was able to mislead and cause pain to Elaine uh, and Nynaeve while she was being held captive with the item. So for intelligence, Mogideon gets a 9 out of 10 because she really does demonstrate quite a bit of intelligence throughout the series. As for her impact on the story and her arc, 
she's around for most of the story. Uh, she causes Brigitta to be ripped from the pattern, she hurts Nynaeve and Elaine a few times, and she causes discord during the last battle. She also stays with her arc as a survivor, and one with kind of the worst type of luck, unfortunately. She gets an 8 out of 10 for her arc. Lastly, is she scary? I kind of think she is. There's a large amount of fear and dread that Nynaeve and Elaine feel for a long time. Uh, that Mogidium would find them from the shadows and kill them or, or hurt, hurt them or hurt their loved ones. Her ability to control the world of dreams is also really scary. Uh, and of course she's a Forsaken. So she's going to get an 8 out of 10 for Inspiring Fear. In total, Mogidium gets a 39 out of 50 and earns the number 10 spot on my list. Coming in at the number 9 spot is another female Forsaken, this time Semirag. Semirag is formerly the greatest healer from the Age of Legends but then she turned to the shadow and had a deranged sadistic streak in her where she just liked to torture and harm people. So as for motivation, this is where I feel like she's the most lacking. We get the backstory that she was forced to choose between stilling or binding against hurting other people uh, while before she healed them, and instead she just chose to join the shadow. But to me, it was always kind of somewhat blandly evil and sadistic. She didn't develop this, but rather she was just kind of always that way. And while this can happen with people, I don't find that incredibly compelling uh, for motivation in a character. So she's going to get a 6 out of 10 for motivation from me. As for power levels, she's one of the most powerful female Forsaken, and she holds a role that is high among the Shan Chan politically. She's able to manipulate events as well as her significant ability with the One Power. She's one of the stronger female Forsaken with the power as well, so she's going to get a 9 out of 10 for power. Intelligence-wise... She's always shown to be very intelligent. She's meticulous with all things, including her plans and torture. We don't see tons of examples of her manipulating events, but when we do see her torture the Aes Sedai, for instance, we see how devious and intelligent she is. And so for intelligence, I'm going to give Simarog an 8 out of 10. For her impact on the story, now this is a weird one to rate. But when we do see her, she's very important to the story and very impactful. For instance, her control of the Shan Chan, and when she captures Rand and forces him to almost kill Min, is incredibly impactful and that almost breaks Rand completely. Yet she's just not present for much of the story and that kind of ultimately lowers her ranking for me. She's going to get a 7 out of 10 for story and impact. Lastly, here's where Semirag shines. For simply being scary, she's easily the scariest of the Forsaken to me. She inspires fear simply by being who she is. She's horrifying in her sadistic nature and the pain that she likes to cause. It's kind of freaky how much she enjoys it. And so to me, she easily gets out of 10 out of 10 for being a scary, scary woman. In total, Semirag gets a 40 out of 50 and earns the number 9 spot on my list. So with number 8, we have not a person, but a group of people as a whole. I actually think the White Cloaks themselves are have a rather interesting arc, uh, if you view them as a character, and hence why I'm going to group them together as an organization here and rank them accordingly. For motivation, I really think this is the highlight for them. While I certainly don't agree with their ideology, it's clear that real people are swept up into bigotry, condemning others for what they can't control, and overall projecting their own fear onto others. It's a, such a real dynamic in the world, and Robert Jordan captures it really well with the White Cloaks. You can understand why they act as they do, because most of us know people who act like they do. And so for motivation, they're going to get a 10 out of 10 from me. As for power, this is weird because they don't channel, they don't have access to magic of any kind, but they do wield political and military power. And they don't have the largest military out there, but they're well-trained, well-equipped, and they're very skillfully commanded. They begin the series having more powerful than they end it with, because the armies kind of grow exponentially in size, but they do wield power for quite a bit of the series. The White Cloaks get a 7 out of 10 for power. For intelligence, they are woefully misguided and have a number of blunders because they're unable to accept things to be truth because of their prejudices for the most part. They refuse to believe in truth and it kind of hurts their decision making. For instance, when they hear about rumors in Terabon about the Shan Chan and refuse to believe them. However, they are commanded well and they're effective in their goals much of the time and they're skilled at manipulation both locally and turning people on one another as well as politically across the landscape of the countries. Pedro Nile was exceptionally skilled at that, and so for Intelligent, the, the White Cloaks are going to get a 6 out of 10. As for their overall arc and effect on the story, here's again where I feel like they shine. The White Cloaks begin the series as kind of secondary villains. They're not necessarily evil, but they certainly are antagonists. They're bigoted, violent, and they're accountable to almost no one. They evolve over the course of the series to learn and fight alongside those that they hate. They realize the truths that they clung to that defined their hatred were wrong. They impact a number of storylines throughout the books as well. The White Cloaks get a 10 out of 10 from me. In total, the White Cloaks get a 40 out of 50 and are number 8 spot on the list. 
Coming in at number seven, we have Elida. The Amarlin seat, foil to Swan Sanche, and the other rebel Aes Sedai, and opposed to just about everything that she should be fighting for in the story. She's a character that many fans love to hate. So her motivations to me are one of her stronger features. She is masterfully created as a character to me because I feel like she's so real. We can see why she thinks what she thinks why she does what she does, and how she believes she's right the entire time. She's never really evil, she just has a very set way of thinking that guides her actions. She's a narcissist to a fault, and then she's also influenced by Pot on Fane to make that much, much worse. She believes that she's always right, and that everything is always about her. She makes decisions based on her own self-interest, yet justifies it by thinking that it's good for the tower. This is really even justifying it to herself. She creates a culture of fear and mistrust around her, and she's kind of a loose cannon. Her motivations in understanding why she does what she does, she gets a 10 out of 10 from me. Her power, Elida isn't the strongest in the one power, although she is very strong as I said I are concerned. She is the Amarlin seat and has the power of that office behind her. She certainly has the ability to affect the events in the world and those, that, those around her she gets an 8 out of 10 from power for me. As for intelligence, this is interesting because she isn't dumb. She's shown at the beginning of her story to be the one that figures out uh, that Swan, what Swan was up to, and she's good at seeing more than what's there. What brings her down is the same thing as the White Cloaks, and that's that her prejudice and assumptions influenced her thinking in the wrong direction, that she ended up being wrong a lot. For instance, sending 40 sisters to the Black Tower, assuming that there couldn't be many more than one or two that could channel. She isn't necessarily wrong to assume that there should only be a couple, uh, because based on the past, that would have been a safe assumption. But things like this caused her to become less and less intelligent because she just underestimated everybody all the time. Pot on Fane's influence also changed her a lot, I believe, and so she gets a 6 out of 10 for intelligence. For her overall story and arc, Elida gets a high score here. She's very impactful on the story. She's one of the driving forces behind a number of the plot lines. She as a character evolves in a deterioration of her intelligence and her sanity as power corrupts her further and further uh, until she actually gets captured by the Shan Chan. She's gonna get a 10 out of 10 here from me. For being scary and fear inspiring, I don't know that I was ever afraid of her, but more of what dumb thing she might do next that would infuriate us as readers. She was a little bit more Dolores Umbridge than Freddy Krueger here. <laughs> So that being said, we love to hate her, and that makes her a good villain, so I'm going to give her a 7 out of 10. In total, Elida gets a 41 out of 50 and earns the number 7 spot on the list. Coming in at number 6 on my list, we have the ultimate final baddie in the series, the Dark One itself. The Dark One is essentially a fundamental force of nature opposed to the creator, so obviously on a different level than the other characters on this list but nevertheless still worthy of inclusion. For motivation, this is actually a hard one for the Dark One. The Dark One is simply what it is. It has no motivation. Uh, the Dark One is an agent of chaos and destruction and is simply incapable of empathy and order. This may make sense given who and what it is, but it's not very compelling as a character. So five out of 10 here. As for power, this one's easy. Easily the most powerful character on the list, so 10 out of 10. Intelligence, I'd say the same thing here. Knows pretty much everything that's happening and manipulates the world events. Uh, another easy 10 out of 10. It's going to be the same for Impact as well. The Dark One drives the entire story and is behind almost everything that happens. Then we get to learn more about the Dark One during the last battle, uh, where he's kind of going back and forth with Rand, uh, and this really gives us more of a glimpse into what the Dark One was trying to accomplish. Uh, 10 out of 10 here for Impact and Arc. Now, for being fear-inspiring, I'm not sure why, but the Dark One was never really especially scary to me. It's probably because he's it's an abstract entity rather than a true character, but there are times that the Dark One is incredibly intimidating, I'm just never terrified. This might work differently in the show on a visual medium, but I was just never really that scared. Uh, I'm going to give the Dark One a 7 out of 10. So in total, the Dark One gets a 42 out of 50 and the number 6 spot on the list. Breaking into the top 5, we have the Shan Chan. Now here's another time where I've grouped an entire group of people in as a villain. Even though not all of them were evil or really villains in their own right, I thought that it would make sense for to use them as a as a group as a character. And so for motivations, the Shan Chan are motivated by deeply held beliefs about the way women that channels should be treated and really enslaved and controlled uh, for the good of society. They also have a very deep caste system within their culture. The evil things that they do are deeply ingrained in their culture. 
That doesn't make it right, but it helps us understand why they act as they do, why they do the things that they do. They get a 10 out of 10 here. As for power, the Shan Chan are incredibly powerful with their use of channelers, their huge armies, their special forces, the beasts they use, as well as their social programs and establishment uh, of order in the lands that they rule. They essentially stalemate the rest of the Westlands in battle, uh, all on their own. Uh, they get a 10 out of 10 for power. As for intelligence, they have very strong commanders and smart rulers, yet they do not always do the smartest thing, just really based again on prejudice that they hold and cultural biases. They rely on superstitions and signs rather than the facts at times, and so for this they're going to get a 7 out of 10 for me. For impact and story arc, again, another easy 10. Uh, they drive quite a bit of the plot, and they're integral to the forces of the light being victorious, despite not really being the good guys, really. The fact that they're being forced to confront their cultural views on women uh, who can channel at the end of the story, what that's going to do to their culture in a post-Last Battle world, uh, that was really compelling to me as well. They're going to get a 10 out of 10 for story and arc. Now, the Shan Chan are not necessarily fear-inspiring. They do horrific things with slavery, and they, have, they hold some pretty horrible views, but I was never terrified by them. I was never really scared. Uh, they don't inspire fear at just the sight of them, and so for that, they're going to get a 6 out of 10 from me. So in total, the Shan Chan get a 43 out of 50, and they're going to get the number 5 spot on the list. With the number 4 spot on the list, we have Pot on Fane. Pot on Fane is a very unique villain that is essentially a mixture of a number of different evils, and yet he's really his own character. For motivations, he would seem to represent exactly what I said earlier that wasn't compelling. He's basically evil for the sake of being evil, right? Well, not necessarily. I think he's absolutely crazy, driven mad by the shadow and the dormant evil of Shadar Logoth, and of course the ways. He spreads discord and distrust, and he's single-minded in his pursuit of those that are that were part of his torture. So this is Rand and Perrin and Matt and all of them. So while he is just plain out evil, and he really doesn't have any redeemable qualities, he's actually still very compelling. Pot on Fane gets a 10 out of 10 from me for motivations. For power, the total extent of Pot on Fane's power is never really explained. It's almost sort of like a soft magic system in of itself. He seems to be able to manipulate people and he has what he calls tricks that can cause pain and kill people. He can turn into a fog that instantly kills people that touch it. The dagger that he carries can kill with a nick. He seems to be able to control the black wind and the ways, and he can control shadow spawn after he corrupts them. He's extremely powerful, and he almost kills Rand a few times. He also has a corrupting influence on those that he's around. And so he's going to get a 10 out of 10 for power from me. For intelligence, he has shown himself to be very manipulative and a schemer. Although his schemes at times seem to be more fueled by his crazed thoughts than really coherent planning. He is intelligent, but he's not a genius based on his level of insanity. I think it keeps him from being a skilled manipulator of events on a larger scale than just a few people. And so for that reason, he's going to get a 7 out of 10. As for his impact, I, I think this really could have gone differently for me if the story had not ended how it did. Uh, he was a huge part of the story and was a central part of the plot for many different plot lines. He affected Elida and the White Cloaks. He almost killed Rand. He corrupted Shadowspawn, and he even gave Rand the idea of how to cleanse Sidene. The issue I have with him is basically that he disappears towards the end of the books, and then he reappears just to die really easily. It was almost an afterthought, uh, and so for that reason, he gets a 7 out of 10. Lastly, for being scary, uh, this is where I think he nails it. Uh, Pot on Fane is creepy, vulgar, distinctly evil, and very unempathetic, and he does a whole lot of horrible things. He rapes people and then feeds them to Trollocs alive. He causes pain for fun. He's irrational and erratic and completely unpredictable, which gives a sense of fear around what he's going to do next. He's one of the few characters that we see almost kill Rand as well. Pot on Fane gets a 10 out of 10 for being straight up scary. So in total, Pot on Fane gets a 44 out of 50 and earns the number 4 spot on my list. At number three on the list, we have the Daughter of the Night, Lanfear. Now this one was actually a surprise for me, because if you've seen my Lanfear character analysis video, I wasn't incredibly high on her. But based on my recent reread, I had kind of a change of heart on a few things with her. Uh, let's start with motivation. This is where I probably was the most critical before, as I thought that she was just this really powerful woman that was dumbed down to being like pissy over a guy not liking her. And I thought that was super petty and not really becoming of somebody as powerful as she was. Now, while I don't think that's totally inaccurate, uh, I do think it's a bit more nuanced than that. I think she just craved recognition and adulation, and really she wanted actual power. Luz Theron and Rand were just pathways to that, as 
they were the most powerful people alive. So she was capable of doing good things. She didn't just do evil for the sake of evil, but rather I think everything that she did was in the pursuit of power. So she gets a 9 out of 10 here from me. For power, Lanfear is the most powerful female Forsaken and extremely skilled in the world of dreams, as well as knowledgeable about just a ton of things. She was as strong as a woman could be in the one power, and so she's going to get a 10 out of 10 here. For intelligence, uh, she was very, very smart. She manipulated the other Forsaken for a while. She played a long con with Perrin with her intentions, and she was considered one of the smarter people of her age. But her plans don't always seem to work out as she wished. Uh, and so for that, I'm going to give her a 9 out of 10 in, for intelligence. For her story and her arc, as I said this in my character analysis video, I just didn't feel satisfied with her arc in the final book. And I feel like it was kind of a wasted opportunity for her to sacrifice herself or, you know, make some type of coming back to the light. But then again... That was who she was. Overall, I think she was very integral to the plot and she influenced quite a bit of storylines. Um, I just wish she would have ended a little better. She's going to get a 7 out of 10 from me. Lastly, was she scary? Uh, and I would say she was very scary. Uh, she has the power of emotion behind her actions and that always makes them more powerful. She becomes very irrational and due to the level of power that she has when she's irrational, you have no idea what she's going to do next. Uh, and because of that, I think that she actually is very, very scary. She gets a 10 out of 10 from me. In total, Lanfear gets a 45 out of 50 and gets the number three spot on the list. So we've arrived at number two. Grendel was almost perfect to me. Uh, I loved her as a character. I think she's an outstanding villain. Uh, for her motivations, I just, I get her. Um, in her distant past, she was a psychologist. She led a very austere lifestyle and was very, very reserved. With the release of the Dark One, she realized with power, she could do anything she wanted and she could satisfy any desire. Here's the question I was asked, folks. What would you do if you had unlimited power and no accountability and check on yourself? What would you do? What are the things that you would act on if you could do whatever? And I think that's what Grendel becomes. I think her development is very believable. Grendel gets a 10 out of 10 here for me. For power, Grendel is very powerful, a female forsaken, but she never really shows herself to be at the top of the charts like some of the other ones do. She doesn't wield a ton of political power, preferring to be kind of behind the scenes. And so while she's, you know, like crazy powerful, she only gets a 9 out of 10 here. As for her intelligence, she, along with Moradin, is the most intelligent Forsaken. She's manipulative, she reads people really well, and she uses her lifestyle to mask her intentions. And that's kind of genius. Uh, she makes people underestimate her, and she's incredibly devious. This is probably my favorite aspect of Grendel's character. She gets a 10 out of 10 here from me. For her story and her arc, I love her role in the background and how she slowly becomes more and more a part of the fight. Her role in the last battle is great and it showed why she was such a tough opponent. I loved her here and she's going to get a 9 out of 10 here for story and impact. Only knocked back a little because she's not so present early in the books. Lastly, probably her weakest attribute is that she's never really overtly terrifying. She's someone to be feared, but that isn't always something that you notice. And mostly because she disguises herself as being a hedonist to throw people off her intentions. That being said, she's still pretty damn scary. Uh, she gets an 8 out of 10 here. In total, Grendel gets a 46 out of 50 and earns the number 2 spot on my list. So at number 1, really probably not too much of a surprise, we have a Shamael or Moradin. The avatar of the Dark One, the counter to Rand. He's really set up to be the ultimate bad guy. For motivation, I love that Shamael has a very nuanced and rational reason for not only following the Dark One originally, but also why he wants the Dark One to win in the present. He doesn't want eternal life. In fact, he wants his life to end. He hates himself, and he wants the nothingness that's going to come from the Dark One's victory. The Dark One will always raise him up if he dies, and so he just wants to, it all to end. None of the other Chosen understand the nature of the Dark One like Shamael does. So he's going to get a 10 out of 10 for motivation. For power, he's the most powerful character other than Rand and the Dark One in the story, and so he easily gets a 10 out of 10 here. For intelligence, he has manipulated events in the world for 3,000 years. He moves people around like pawns. He knows philosophy. He understands how to create fear and motivate people. He created the culture of the Dark Friends. He gets a 10 out of 10 here easy. As for his impact and role in the story, I do wish we got a little bit more of him. Uh, that being said, I loved his ending. I love that he felt like the battle was between him and Rand. And then when it came down to it, he was basically just a meaningless pawn in the, in the whole battle. And that Rand just used him as a conduit for the true power. Rand had moved so far past him in levels of power. Um, I thought that was such a great ending um, for his arc. Uh, 10 out of 10 here for impact. And lastly, he started off the story being more fear-inducing in a traditional sense by looking scary, having his eyes on fire, and uh, using dreams to torture the boys as they searched for them. But as time went by, he became scary in a different way. When he recovered his sanity, hence when he was reborn as Morden, 
Uh, he inspired fear by really cold, calculated actions that kind of took the... He basically had an utter lack of remorse as he executed the Dark One's plans, and it could be kind of chilling. Uh, he gets a 9 out of 10 here. In total, Borden gets a 49 out of 50 and earns the number one spot on the list. So that's my list of the top 10 villains from the Wheel of Time. Uh, you can see the total list, like all of the rankings, not just the top 10, on my Patreon. That'll be posted up as soon as this video goes live. So if you want to see how the other characters did and where they ranked, you can check that out. The link to the Patreon is in the description below. But I want to hear what you all think. What did you think of my list? What would you have changed? Let me know in the comments below. And make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel to be notified when I post new Wheel of Time content. Check out the Patreon to support what I do here and join us in our Discord server where we talk Wheel of Time all the time. Those links are all in the description down below. Hey guys, thanks for watching and until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do. Mistress up above, slipping on a rope of blue. She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free. Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?